Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to a lovely jaunt where we read better, not more. Today I wanted to do kind of just a spontaneous check-in on my reading. I'm not sure how consistently or how frequently I want to do this. I wish I could do it like every weekday because I just picked up Emma and I started rereading Emma by Jane Austen as I'm working through all of Austen's novels for Jane Austen July and it looks like it's probably going to extend into Austen August for me. The less popular but good excuse for me to keep reading her books. And today instead of doing like a full presentation I just have a couple of notes on my daily reading kind of bringing back the reading diary style for today. So we're gonna be a little bit less organized, a little bit more off the cuff, but hopefully you still get something good out of it. So right, as I mentioned, like I'm starting Emma. I believe I've for sure, I've for sure read Emma once before, possibly twice before, I just don't remember. There's a pretty good chance I've read it twice before, but I never really feel like picking up this novel whenever I'm in the mood for Jane Austen. It's much more likely that I'll pick up Persuasion, Mansfield, Pride, Sense, literally any of her other novels, Northanger, rather than this one. This is really my least favorite of Austen's major novels, and the funny thing about it is that it's actually the most critically acclaimed novel. Critics by far think that this is her masterpiece. And in fact, even in the introduction to this book, which is written by a gentleman named Stephen Marcus, he is clearly a huge Austen fan and a huge Emma fan in particular, which is wonderful. You should have somebody who loves the novel writing the introductory essay, as far as I'm concerned. But he sort of quoted, it must have been Austen in one of her letters, sort of saying that she was in Emma, was writing a heroine that may be a heroine that she that only she could like. and. I honestly find that to be true. I, I'm just like, I don't dislike Emma and Austen's wonderful style is still present and lovely and so enjoyable to read, but I never think like, oh, I want to live inside of Emma's world. I want to live inside of Emma's mind. And I think maybe from that perspective, we can see this novel as being Austen's most self-indulgent novel. And in fact, I was talking with a friend of mine about it recently and she definitely felt that way. She's an editor and a writer herself and she sort of is an advocate that maybe this novel could have been edited down in this Austin's longest novel. I mean, there's probably room for that, but then like, who am I to say, contrary to all of the critics everywhere of Jane Austen that this book needs to be edited but her other ones don't, when apparently this is her best, best novel. So there's that. But then also like, I'm an artist and I'm a painter and I literally do not paint for anybody else except for myself. And I, it's an entirely a self-indulgent process for me. And I do not care what anybody else wants me to paint or if they like it. And I, so there's, I have no sense of editing my artistic work either. So I think there's, the other side of the equation, which is that an author or any kind of artist should have that self-indulgent experience, should have at least one work in their repertoire where they got to really just write or create what made them happy. And since the critics sort of unanimously think it's brilliant, I'm much more likely to think that my opinion is wrong. So it's not so much that I'm going to say that I enjoy it when I don't. I think there's a difference there between preference and quality and I have no problem sort of distinguishing those things which is like, you know, what I like is not necessarily what's best and of the highest quality. And I think that sort of brings me to the point which is that this book is still worth reading and still worth rereading. And in fact, I still enjoy it far more than many other novels. It's just not my favorite, Austin. And the other thing too is that I'm gonna power th through this introductory essay. I don't think I've ever read it before because I don't have any annotations in it. And it, I mean, this is a hefty essay. This thing is a chonker. Let's see, let me see if there's shape. Like that's all the introductory essay right there. It's like a good 80, 100 pages. So anyway, he's quite thorough in his treatment. But I did notice too, and I kind of got on my Instagram about this, that there are certain sections of his writing that fall into the trap of like bad academic writing, in my opinion, where you're using so many technical terms and so many seemingly made up words 
that it serves to obfuscate rather than clarify, which is not the point of criticism. So it seems needlessly complex to me. And then there are times where he sort of stops doing that and his point comes through more clearly. And maybe it's just that I'm not a strong enough reader to understand it. That's fine. Maybe I'm just not educated enough. And, and maybe I, if I get become a stronger reader in the future, I will find it less distasteful. But there are parts of his writing that is really strong and really interesting. And then there are other parts where I think like he gets a bit meandering. Nonetheless, <laughs> I'm going to power through this essay. I'm going to power through this novel because I really have the preconceived assumption that first of all, Stephen Marcus is probably smarter than me. And he, or Marcus Stephen. Stephen Marcus. Yeah, I said that right. Um, he's probably smarter than me, and he certainly knows more about Emma than I do. I've spent more time re reading and studying this novel than I have. So whether or not I like his style is kind of moot. Like, I still have, like, some valuable nuggets and a lot to learn from this person. And likewise with the novel, just because it's not my personal favorite doesn't mean that there isn't a lot to be gotten out of this novel. And maybe I can appreciate it in a new way if I kind of step back and let my prejudices sort of sit to the side. And I think that the overarching theme there is like approaching your books, approaching your essays, approaching, you know, your texts with an attitude of humility. It's a virtue that I think is not extolled enough in our modern times of Instagram and humble bragging and all of these types of things in our society that, you know, it's to our advantage to put ourselves forward, to kind of show off, to constantly create content, to constantly be in front of other people's eyes, even I myself am creating content right now, but I think it's really important to approach your literature and approach your texts with a humble attitude because I don't know everything. That's the whole point. I'm reading this because I'm trying to expand my vision. So if I come in with a really closed-minded attitude, then I'm already sort of getting myself off on the wrong foot. So as much as I like to tease academics for their bad writing and their bad style and their pretentiousness, so, I mean, someone could certainly tease me for those same, same things. I'm absolutely, you know, vulnerable to those same criticisms. And so I think it's just important to have, hey, maybe a good sense of humor. I think Austin would agree with that. And then also set aside your prejudices for a little while, step into the world and the mind of the other person, try to understand where they're coming from and take what's valuable forward with you. So that is my goal with this book. Hopefully I'll be able to finish the introductory material tonight and get into some of the actual novels so that we can actually talk about the novel tomorrow. But that's what I've got for you today. Until next time, <laughs> my name is still, wait, until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.